Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Church. I'm John Fry, pastor of worship ministry, and I have the joy of welcoming all of you here today. We're so glad you came. Today, we're continuing in our Fix Our Eyes series. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so as we sing today, let's remember to open the eyes of our hearts. Let's open our lives before him. Let's fix our eyes on him and let's sing and let's praise him together. Would you please stand and we'll do just that.
be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Ben and I'm one of the pastors of Calvary and we're so glad that you decided to come out and uh, shut yourselves indoors on a beautiful day just to worship with us. How many of you are excited for the end of the service when you get to go out in the sunshine? Yeah, this Georgia boy can't wait. Um, we're, we're super excited that you're here this morning, and, and for a few minutes, I want to talk to you about what we call next steps. And one of the things that we are oriented towards at Calvary is leading you to pursue life in Christ. And we use the terminology of our walk with God, because it is a walk. You know, things that stay stagnant turn stale, and they die. But we're designed by our Heavenly Father to have freshness of life in Christ. But we've got to keep moving to do that. And so every week, we hold a gathering at the end of our service called the Welcome Gathering. It's designed as a first step for those of you who are here for the first, second, maybe third time. And every week, we meet someone who's here for the very first Sunday. It's amazing to us that new people just keep coming, and so thank you to those of you who decided to join us, and maybe it's your first time. We would love for you to carve out 10 minutes of your morning immediately following this service and join us in the east end of our lobby so that we can shake your hand, we can learn your name, we can make this big gathering feel a little bit smaller like a family, and we can help you learn how we think about your walk with God and leads you to take some next steps. So if you're new, we'd love to have you join us at our welcome gathering. Maybe you're sitting here and you said, Ben, I did that. I came to the welcome gathering. What's next? Well, next Sunday, we have Discover Calvary. It's a first step of sorts, but really a next step for most of us. So if you came to the welcome gathering and you're still here, you know, you're trying to explore what's going on at Calvary, we would love for you to set aside an hour starting at 9.15 next Sunday. Join us in the chapel. Bo is going to unpack our vision and values, some of the ethos about Calvary Church and how we think about discipleship and walking with God. And you know, Many of you are not new. You're, you're like the 90% of people in the room and you're, you wrote the book on Calvary and you say, discover Calvary, that's not for me, I don't need that. Well, the last time we did discover Calvary, I actually ran into a dear friend of mine, a couple who've attended Calvary for more than 11 years and they were coming out of discover Calvary and I was walking over to say hello to a few people and they came up to me and they said, Ben, we get it. The light bulb just went off for us. We went to Discover Calvary. We've been occupying a pew for almost 12 years now, and we've got to take a step. We've got to do something. We don't want to just sit. We want to be involved. And so maybe that's you. Maybe you're here, and and you've been at Calvary for years or decades. Can I encourage you and maybe challenge you? Come to Discover Calvary. I don't know if you've noticed, but things aren't the same around here as they used to be. 
And Discover Calvary is an environment designed for you to learn how we think and what we're looking for as we continue to do life together. Next Sunday, put it on your calendar. But then today, today we're doing something right after the service that we call Connect at Calvary. This is a frequent, but not weekly. It comes up sporadically. Connect at Calvary is a ministry environment to help you connect. You know, perhaps you're sitting out there and you're saying, you know, Ben, I've been coming for a couple of months, a couple of years, and I just, I feel like something's missing. I don't have that group of people, that community in my life that's walking with me as I pursue life in Christ. Or maybe I do feel stale and kind of stagnant and I feel like something's missing, but I don't know what. We've designed Connect at Calvary with you in mind. We want to start a conversation with you. You know, my wife and I have been here for about four years. And it's taken us almost that long to figure out how we fit and how we connect in this big place. Connect at Calvary is just the beginning of a journey. And so if you're here and you feel like you need to exercise a little bit and flex some exploration muscles, we want to start a conversation with you at Connect at Calvary. As soon as this service is over, just come straight out the doors in the back. We'll be in the courtyard overlook area and we want to help you as you take a step towards growth pursuing life in Christ. You know, we, um, I, this is kind of, I, I almost didn't share this with you today because it's a little personal and maybe you say, I don't need to know that much about your life, Ben, and maybe you don't. My wife and I, we have two boys and we just found out that we're expecting number three. It's a little girl. Thanks for clapping. That bought me enough time to fight back the the wave of tears that's building up in my eyeballs. You want to get me crying? Just ask me to talk about my Savior and my children, and it's over. Like you just toast. I'm done. We're expecting a little girl. She's coming in September, Lord willing. And uh, I, I got to tell you, I am so grateful that my family can be a part of this family. And from the very first day that my daughter is held by a volunteer in our nursery, she's being encouraged to take intentional next steps in pursuing life in Christ. Do you realize how amazing we have it? That we attend a church where we want everyone to be pursuing Jesus. And if you're here and you're just sitting, can I call you? Like We need to be moving. If you feel new, come to the welcome gathering. If you feel like you don't have a clue what's going on around here, set aside some time next Sunday and come to Discover Calvary. And if you feel like you need to take a step, we'd love to have a conversation with you at Connect at Calvary as soon as we're done in here. And in that vein, let me pray for us as we continue in our morning. Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for what you have done on our behalf in putting your Son forward for our sin. You took care of the hardest part, and now every step that we get to take with you is like icing on the cake. It's the gift behind the gift. And God, I pray for that person who's here, and they're just kind of sniffing around this Christian thing. Would you make this place a safe place where questions and doubts are not obstacles, but they are invitations to further a conversation about you? And for those of us who've been around for a while, would you challenge us? What's our next step? Because things that sit still get stale. And we want to experience the freshness of life in Christ. Would you encourage us this morning? to take steps of growth for your glory and for our good. And Lord, as we continue in our time this morning, would you be our vision? Would you set our eyes on you that all we do would be leveraged in your direction? And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
eyes on Jesus. He's the originator and the perfecter of our faith. Would you stand? Let's open our eyes. Let's open our heart. Of earth are dealing in the light 
of your glory and grace I'll set the sights upon heaven I'm fixing my eyes on you Good morning, everyone. My name is Bo Eckert, the senior pastor here at Calvary Church. I hope that you saw this morning the diversity of music, but how all of it encouraged us to fix our eyes right there uh, on him. So uh, a couple of matters of housekeeping before we jump into week two of Fix My Eyes. One, if you weren't here last week, we are providing for this series a reading plan uh, through the books of Judges and Ruth. That's what this series is, is about. Uh, we provided it for everyone last week. If you weren't here and you want a hard copy of it, you can pick one up as you leave today in the Connection Centers, or you can also find it on our website. Um, this is a series that's a long book. We're not going to cover every verse and every story in the book. And as you've heard me say over and over and over again, we want to equip you to be reading your Bible for yourself. And so this plan will help you to do that. There's even some information on the back of how to read narrative literature and some questions to ask as you're doing that. So pick one of those up on your way out if you don't have it. And you can see on that reading plan and you can also see on the back of your bulletin the, the series outline so you know what we're covering each and every week. Um, a reminder for those that haven't heard yet, uh, the message that's coming up on May 3rd, uh, two weeks from now, um, I've rated that message PG-13. Parents are strongly cautioned. Uh, the, the content uh, and the things that we're going to talk about that day, uh, what we're really encouraging, um, if you have kids sixth grade and under, for them to not be in the room. I'm not going to curse or, you know, anything inappropriate like that. But if you're familiar with Judges 19 to 21, it's adult content. There's some violence. There's some other things in there that I want to be able to preach that, that those, those chapters, uh, be true to that. I will be as guarded as I can be, but uh, we've provided children's ministry environments uh, for those that are young, sixth grade and younger uh, that, that would love for your children to be a, a part of that morning. If they're normally not a part of what's going on uh, at the 11 o'clock hour, uh, you can be in touch with our children's ministry and they'll let you know uh, what's provided for, for, for your child that day. Um, if they're going to be in the room, um, that's fine as well, uh, but we just want to give you that, uh, that, that, that warning ahead of time. Okay, today we continue in the series entitled Fix My Eyes. It's a look at uh, the time period of Judges and Ruth in the Old Testament, and it's a time period uh, that's marked by this one verse that comes out of Judges chapter 21 that says, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Not much different than the time period that we live in today. Really, it's not any different from any time period that human beings uh, have been on planet Earth. There's something within us. There's something that sin does to our hearts that, that we want to be in control. We want to be the ones that are uh, determining what's going on. We want to do what we think is right. And so as we go through this series, we're going to see the results of that uh, during this time period. Some of you, you say, you don't even have to tell me, you know, you don't even have to give me any examples. I can just tell you some stories from my own life where I did what I thought was right, and here's the destruction and the consequences uh, that came. Uh, we talked last week about the cycle of the judges. Some of you are familiar uh, with this cycle. Let me put it up here for you. We're working around this uh, in clockwise fashion. Um, and if you go and Google cycle of judges, you're going to see all kinds of charts like this. And some people use different words and they add more words. There's nothing, you know, that, that, that uh, this isn't uh, inspired or anything like that. This is just helps me to think about uh, what was going on. First up at the top, we see the, the disobedience of God's people. And as a result of that disobedience, it led to disaster. Why did that take place during that time period? Because God had established his covenant, the Mosaic covenant 
uh, Exodus chapter 19, repeated again in Deuteronomy 28 and other places, where God came to his people and said, if you do this, if you follow, if you obey, here's what I'm gonna do and here's what's gonna happen. But if you turn from me, if you incline your hearts to someone or something else, here will be the result. Disaster will come upon you. And so when the disaster comes, sometimes the people came, oftentimes the people came and either repented or they at least cried out to God. Maybe the repentance wasn't there, but the crying out to God because of their oppression uh, followed the disaster. And then God hearing his people cry out, then God would send and, and, and deliver them oftentimes through what we would call a judge, a leader, uh, somebody that God would use. But after that judge came and ruled, uh, the people turn back and the cycle begins all over again. So that's a general outline of the, the, the cycle that takes place as you read through uh, the book of Judges. Not every cycle is exactly that way. And in, in a sense, there's a, a, a spiraling downward that it gets worse and worse uh, as you go through the book. But that gives you an idea. Of, uh, of what it was like. So uh, today we are in Judges chapter 6, and I encourage you to open there uh, with me this morning. It's found on page 205 in the Pew Bible in front of you. Uh, and as you're turning there, uh, just a couple comments uh, about this uh, message this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to cover three chapters. So just as we did last week, I'm going to kind of do a hop, skip, and a jump through, this, uh, through these three chapters of the life of Gideon. Gideon is the judge that we're going to look at today. So uh, I, I really don't want you to get frustrated, but I really want you to, to be reading this for yourself. And I hope that I can give you the flow and the outline so you can go back uh, later today or sometime this week and pick up uh, the, the, the details for yourself as you read Judges uh, 6 through 8. The other thing that we want to be cautious of, and, and, and I'll do my best with this, and, and you need to do your best with this as you read scripture. Um, this is a narrative section of literature. It, the, the author, the narrator is telling us what took place, and it's describing for us what took place. I don't know if you realize this or not. Some people don't. Um, all of the Bible is not the same type of literature. When you read Paul's letters in the New Testament, those letters uh, and other parts of scripture are very prescriptive. They tell us what we should be doing, but there's other parts of scripture like this that are narrative narrative sec sections of scripture, and, and they are descriptive of what's going on. So you have to be careful when you come to narrative, you have to be careful when you come to descriptive types of, 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 of scripture that we don't just say, oh, this happened to them, so therefore, you know, it's going to happen to us, or they promised them to them, and, and, and therefore the same promise applies to us. Um, but you can see on the outline today, I am going to try to apply it to us, not just because it happened to Gideon, but I believe some of the things that happened to Gideon can be supported throughout the rest of Scripture and that we can make that general uh, application uh, as we go through. And, and I'll actually uh, reference some other passages of Scripture to help us to see that and to do that. So um, Gideon is the story that we're looking at today in Judges chapter 6. He's going to help us to see beyond our external circumstances and appearances and to see what's really going on in your heart. So as you, as you track with me for the next 30 minutes or so, I'd really ask you to have your heart open and say, God, what's going on in my heart? What's happening inside of me? And would you reveal that uh, as we work through this passage today? Uh, so first and foremost, we're going to see how God sees me. Through the life of Gideon, we're going to see how God views and sees me. Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The cycle starts all over again after a, a good time um, uh, under Deborah leading them. Um, now we see them turn back and they do evil in the eyes of God. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, why would God do that? Because God is keeping his end of the bargain. He's keeping his end of the covenant. If you turn from me, here's what's going to happen. And as you read through chapter six, you get a great description of the oppression and the disaster that came upon God's people. Verse 2, 
They overpowered Israel, forcing the Israelites to go into the dens and to the caves. Verse 4, they devoured the produce of the land. Verse 5, they laid waste to the land that they came into. They were like locusts. You couldn't count the number that came and brought oppression against the people of Israel. So you get a great description of what God allowed to take place in the life of Israel as a result of them turning from God. And we come to verse 6 of chapter 6 and we see a little summary statement of it and Israel was brought very low because of Midian really the way you could say that was uh, the Israelites were brought very low because of their own choice to turn and depart from the ways of the Lord and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Again, I don't know if the author is intentionally uh, not including this. Was there repentance from the people or did the people just cry out because of the oppression that were there? I don't know. Sometimes that's what happens in my life. I'm experiencing something difficult. I might be experiencing something difficult that came about as a poor choice that I've made. Do I cry out to God in repentance or do I just cry out to God to to relieve the, the, the circumstances that are going on in my life that I don't like? Either way, God hears them. It's interesting as you read uh, verses 7 through 11, or 7 through 10, he doesn't immediately send the judge to deliver them. First, he sends a prophet. He sends a prophet to help them to see and to understand what's going on and why. But then we come to verse 11 where we see the beginning of him raising up this judge named Gideon. And God sends a messenger. An angel of the Lord came and he sat under the terebinth at Orphrah, which belonged to Joash. And Joash was the father of Gideon. While his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So that gives us some understanding of the oppression that was taking place. Gideon is supposed to be out in the open, out on the threshing floor, beating the wheat so that the wind can blow away the chaff, but he's not doing it out in the open. He's doing it in hiding because he had the fear of the Midianites. And some people might say, oh, you know, maybe he didn't have a threshing floor. Maybe he just had to make do with what he had. And, you know, maybe that's the case. You know, I, I, I don't know. But, uh, but it tells us that uh, he is in hiding uh, because of the oppression that's coming from the Midianites. But the angel of the Lord finds him and comes and says this, the Lord is with you. O mighty man of valor. And to that, Gideon probably turned and said, who are you talking to? I don't see myself as a mighty man of valor. So why would God say this to him? Part of the reason that God says this to him is because of the way that he started the statement. The Lord is with you. And if God is with you, he says to Gideon, then you are a mighty man of valor. But that's not how Gideon viewed himself, and that's true of many of us as well. When we see and we open the pages of Scripture to see how God views us, do we see it from his perspective or do we see life from our perspective? Do we see what he has done for us and who he has created us to be? He says to Gideon, God's with you and you're a mighty man of valor. Verse 13, Gideon's response. Please, sir. He's very polite. Listen, if you're not going to have the right view and if you're going to even be disobedient to God, at least be respectful to him. Please, sir. If the Lord is with us, as you just said, then why has all this happened to us? And then he goes on in the rest of verse 13 and describes all that's happened. Now this should bring you and me great comfort because it should tell us that we are just like every other human that's ever lived and existed no matter the time period. Because all of us, maybe not in these exact words, but all of us have said or thought something very similar. If you're such a good God, then why all this bad and evil things are happening? If you're with me, if you love me, then why do you allow this to happen in my life? If you haven't said it, you've at least thought it. You know people. You probably know somebody specifically in your life that is turned away from God, and this is their reason why. If you're such a good God, 
then why all this evil in the world? Why is my life and my circumstances this way if you're such a good God? It's as if that was God's job description to keep us comfortable. Why did this happen? Well, first, we know it happened to the Israelites because they broke the covenant. It's very clear why the oppression comes. But what about you and me? Isn't it true that there's times that we make a poor choice and God, in his grace and in his mercy, allows us to suffer the consequences of our poor choice? That's an act of grace and mercy from God. Sometimes God protects us from our very poor choices, but sometimes he allows us to suffer and to experience the consequences of the poor choices that we have made. He loves us too much to not allow that to happen. We want to escape our circumstances, but oftentimes God wants to interpret them for us. God often wants understanding more than he wants relief. Because if God always protected us from our poor choices, then why would we ever change? God is desiring an intimate love relationship with each and every one of us. He wants our eyes to be turned and to fixed up, be fixed upon him and to make choices that line up with who he is. And when we don't do that and we act in self-destructive ways, he often will let those consequences come. Because sometimes it's God allowing those consequences to come that will turn us back to him. And I think that's one of the reasons why it happens here. Gideon asks the question, why has all this happened? And God, through the messenger, doesn't respond, but he goes on and says this. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and Gideon's response to that is, this might of mine, what might of mine? Who am I? And save Israel from the hand of Midian. How can he go in the might that is his because of this last statement? Do not I send you? You're not going in your own strength. You're going in the strength that I provide. And you're going because I'm going to be with you. And you say, well, that's just an Old Testament concept. No, this is the exact concept that God brings and reveals to all of us. Even the Apostle Paul says, in my weakness, he is made strong. God knows and realizes uh, Gideon's situation and circumstances, and he wants to be made strong in, G in Gideon's weakness. So here's Gideon's response to that in verse 15. And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Gideon's focus is on himself. And the answer to that question is, You can't. You alone can't do it. And then he gives his resume. Why? Because Gideon's looking at the externals, as many of us often do. I can't do this. I can't do that. Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. Lord, don't you know? Have you checked my IQ? Have you looked at my SAT scores? Do you see how many friends I have on Facebook? Do you know that I can't figure out this Twitter thing for the life of me? I just don't get it. Why would you come to me? Why would you choose me? Why are you picking me? Don't you see how many of you have said the exact same thing? Woe is me, I can't do it. As if he's informing God and bringing some, some light into God's perspective. So here's what God says in response to Gideon giving him his resume in verse 16. And the Lord said to him, Oh then, never mind, I must be at the wrong house. Some of you are like, does it really say that? I'm just making sure you're paying attention. I can stand up here and put anything I want on the screen. I want you to be reading your Bibles and making sure what I'm preaching is right and accurate. That's not what he said. 
If he was viewing it from a human perspective, now, don't send me an email and talk about how heretical it is to make a statement and put a Bible verse there. It's just to make a point. I'm making sure you're tracking with me. Here's what it really says in Judges 6, 16. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. He doesn't give him a pep talk. He doesn't come to him and say, Gideon, you are good enough. You are smart enough. And people like you, Gideon, and you're going to be able to do this because of how much self-esteem that you have. Is that what he does? No. To this unwilling and hesitant servant, God's trump card is, I will be with you. In the same way that he was with Moses, Exodus chapter 3, God comes to Moses in the burning bush, but Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses is just like Gideon. Have you seen my resume? What does God say to Moses? I will be with you. What's the common denominator here? How about Joshua chapter 1? God coming to Joshua. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Do you see a common theme? Moses, Joshua, Gideon. But can that apply to you? We're not being called and asked to do the same thing that Moses and Gideon and Joshua are being called to ask. But make sure you see this. When Jesus comes and dies on the cross and rises from the dead, God raised him from the dead, and he begins his church, and he sends his people out just as he's sending you and I out to do what? to preach the gospel and to make disciples. What does Jesus say to his followers in Matthew 28? Go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that I command you. And behold, I am with you always. God's trump card when he wants to accomplish something in the world, whether it was thousands of years ago or whether it's today, is I will be with you. You and I are not called to the same thing that Gideon was called to. You and I are not called to go over to Egypt and bring God's people out. That was Moses' call. That's not our call. Our call is to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. And the trump card is not how smart we are or how brave we are or what our resume looks like or how much money we make or how good looking we are. The trump card is God will be with you. Just imagine for a moment. Imagine if you went through one week of your life where you actually believed that that was true. How would that change your marriage? How would that change your work environment? How would that change your relationship with your kids? How would that change everything that you do to wake up every morning and say, God is with me. God is in me. His Holy Spirit is in me, leading and guiding and directing. And he wants to accomplish something in and through me. It's not destroying the Midianites, but it's accomplishing what he has called me to do. And he is with me you, with each and every one of us. But we view ourselves from a human perspective. Oh, I can't do this, and oh, I can't do this, and oh, look at this, and look how I failed at this, and look at that, and oh, I just make a mess of this. God's not calling us because we're strong and because we have it together. God's calling us and wants to use us because he will be with us. Do you think that Gideon got it? Watch how patient God continues to be with Gideon as they go through this conversation. Verse 17, Gideon said to him, if I found favor in your eyes, and I just want to say, what are you saying, Gideon? Of course you found favor in God's eyes. Look at the conversation that you just have. But he needed some proof. Show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. And he goes on and he gets a young goat and some unleavened cakes and he brings it back and the the angel of the Lord consumes them to prove that this is a message that's truly from God. You see the way that God is patient with 
him. And then he goes on and he says to Gideon, he said, okay, if we're going to do this, we got to get rid of that altar. Verse 25, pull down the altar of Baal that your father has. Whoa. Gideon's own father has an altar to a foreign god. You got to rip that altar down and you got to build a new altar to the Lord, says God to Gideon. So Gideon, okay, I'll do this, but notice Gideon's fear, notice his weakness. Verse 27, but because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Can you relate to that? I certainly can. God, I think you're calling me to this. I think you want me to do this, but I'm fearful of what human beings will think. So I'm going to do it, Lord, but I'm going to kind of do it in a little bit of a different way just so I can kind of save face in case this doesn't work out. And God is patient with him as he goes through this process. And then we come in verse 36 to what many know Gideon for, and that's putting out the fleece. And I don't know what you think. Do you think the fleece is a good thing that Gideon did or not such a good thing? I'll give you my interpretation of it. You can disagree. You're allowed to do that. Here's what it says in verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, then look what Gideon says. As you have said, he sent a messenger to Gideon, an angel to Gideon that spoke to Gideon and said, Gideon, Gideon here's what I'm going to do through you. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to use you and we're going to defeat the Midianites. And Gideon comes and says, I know that you've said this, but could you just give me one more level of proof? Behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. Threshing floor? Does that strike anything in you? Remember I said earlier, well, maybe we'll give Gideon the benefit of the doubt that he didn't even have a threshing floor, and that's why he was down in the wine press. Looks like he's got a threshing floor to me. He's got a place to, 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 to be pounding the wheat. He just wasn't doing it because he was afraid. I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry all around the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand. As you have said, you said it, Lord, but I don't believe it, so I need you to prove it just one more time. And what does God do? He's incredibly patient. And he shows and he gives Gideon the proof that he needs. And then it wasn't enough for Gideon because he had to do it again, but just in reverse. You can read about that at the end of chapter 6. He's so patient and he's so patient with you and me as well. Because how many times do we do this? We open up God's word. We see what God wants us to do. We see how God views us. We see how God wants us to treat our kids and our spouse and our coworkers. And just he shows us all over the place throughout his word how we're supposed to live, but somehow we think that his word is not enough. God, you've told me this. You tell us this in your word, but God, it would be really great if you could like, you know, put this shape in the clouds and then I could really know this is what you want me to do. And we do our own version of the fleece all the time. Can't we just live and follow and obey and love God as he's revealed himself and revealed how he wants to relate to us? So there's something in Gideon that weakness continues to come out, but God's patience is just put on display. So God comes, and now we're going to see how God is fighting for Gideon and in turn for us as well. So we come into chapter 7 and we see very clearly how God needs to do something in order to make sure people understand that God is the one that's doing it. Chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. If you were going to fight a battle from a human perspective, you'd want to have as many people in the army as possible. But from God's perspective, God flips it on its head. 
and says, I need as few people as possible because if I allow you to have this victory with all these men, with all these warriors, you're going to take the credit for yourself. And you're not going to realize that I'm the one that's done it for you. There is something in us that wants to glorify our own efforts. There's something in us that wants to trust our own proven methods. There's something in us that wants to give credit to our own contribution. And God says, no, when you are weak, that's when I'm strong. Some of you could give wonderful testimony to that. Well, you've come and you've tried to do something or you've tried to minister for the Lord and you've had your act all together and you feel like it kind of fell flat, but then there's times that in your weakness you come and God's strength is made perfect in our weakness and God does a wonderful, wonderful work or a wonderful thing in your life. And you step back and you say, the only way that that could happen is for God to do it. That's what God's looking for. So he takes an army of 32,000 and he dwindles it down to 300. And you can read at the beginning of chapter 7 how that happens and how he does that. So God's now ready for the battle. And would you see again the patience of God with Gideon, verses 9 and 10. That same night, the Lord said to Gideon, Arise! Go down against the camp. We're ready to win this war, for I've given it into your hand. I'm the one that's going to do this. But he gives Gideon an out. But if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. And he says, go down and just overhear what's going on and you're going to learn that I'm about to give the Midianites into your hand. And that's the way that Gideon went because he knew. God knew that he was going to be afraid and he knew he needed some extra encouragement along the way. God continues to be incredibly patient with his unwilling and hesitant servant. So you can read and and you can go through and you can read the battle. It's a great, great story and it's made clear in verse 22 who won the battle. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. God is the one that caused the Midianites to essentially be fighting against themselves. The Israelites didn't even have weapons. They had some jars and torches and trumpets. And God used that to bring about a victory. And as you go through, time will not allow us to go through all that happens afterwards. I encourage you to read uh, chapter 8 for yourself and you see uh, the the way that uh, they pursued. But then there was conflict between some of the tribes in Israel. And it's an, an interesting story. And we come to what we think should be a great time of victory and a great time of celebration. And hopefully it's been made very clear to Gideon and to the rest, who is the one that is fighting for them? But here's what happens, and we see how God never gives up, no matter what our perspective might be. Judges chapter 8, verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, You and your son and your grandson also. Why do they want Gideon to do that? Why do they want Gideon to rule over them? Why do they want Gideon to be their king? Because they say to Gideon, For you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And I would think and I would hope that Gideon would say, No! I haven't done it. Did you see how we won the war? Did you see the weapons that we used? Did you see how many of us there were and how many of them there were? I didn't do it. I just believed and was faithful to what God wanted to do. God's the one that did it. Don't boast in me. Give him the credit. And so what Gideon says next is not incorrect, it's just incomplete. In verse 23, I want him to say, no, give all the credit to God. But here's what he says. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And and there's an aspect of that that you look at that and you say, yes, Gideon, he's finally getting it. 
He's learned his lesson. He's seen how patient God has been with him all through this. And he sees and he understands, no, it's not me, it's God. God is the one to rule over you. I shouldn't be your ruler. I shouldn't be king. You shouldn't have a king like these other nations. God is the one that should rule over you. And so what Gideon does is he seems to say the right thing with his words. He seems to say the right thing externally. But the very next verse, we get a glimpse of what's really going on in his heart. Verse 24, and Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil. And if you read those next verses, you see what else he requests and wants them to come and to give. And here's why. Verse 27, and Gideon, not the people, Gideon, made an ephod or an ephod of it and put it in his city in Orphra. You say, well, why is that a bad thing? Well, we have to first know what an ephod is or an ephod. This was something that was supposed to be part of the attire of the high priest at the tabernacle. It was, it was a garment. It was something that the, the high priest would put over uh, them when they would go in uh, and, and um, do their work uh, for the people uh, interceding before the Lord. And the scripture is very clear that it tells us there's only supposed to be one. There's only supposed to be one at the tabernacle for the high priest. And so Gideon is doing something and he's making something that he shouldn't have made. What I think is going on here, it's as if Gideon says, well, God has used me. I've been a channel for God to accomplish his purposes. So let's kind of, let me make an ephod. Let's kind of set this up so that this continues to happen. And I want to say, no, no, Gideon, God's not asking you to do that. You're taking a good thing that he's given and created and you're making it more than it should. An ephod was a, was a garment, and there's some commentators that actually believe that he didn't just made a garment, but he actually made an image, maybe an image to Baal, maybe some would say an image to himself. And instead of hanging that garment on a pole in the center of town, that he actually made an image of himself or, or of some other god and put that ephod over it. Either way, the narrator tells us that what happened was not good. It says, and all Israel whored after it there. They prostituted themselves towards it and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. Gideon, who God used to do wonderful things and to accomplish a wonderful victory, now comes and he leads his very people back into idolatry. And you just want to say, no, why don't you get it? And then I stop and I look at my own life and say, oh, I understand. Because I do the exact same thing. God does something wonderful in my life and you look back and you can share and you can tell your story and your testimony and God did this and God did this and God did this. But then there's times you say, why do I turn from him? Why do I whore after other things in my life? Why do I set other things above him in my own life? And we know that the the, the human heart has the propensity to do that. That's why it's not a one-time decision. It's ongoing clinging and loving and inclining your heart to him each and every day or this can happen. Here's the tragic end of the story, verse 30. Gideon had 70 sons of his own offspring for he had many Wives, he's acting just like the foreign pagan kings. And his concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son. And he called his name Abimelech. From verse 31, who named his son? Did the concubine? Did one of his other wives? Who named his son? He did. Gideon did. And you say, why is that a big deal? What's wrong with the name Abimelech? You know what that name means? The name means my father, the king. Gideon, with his mouth, said, I'm not going to rule over you. But in his heart, he acted like he was the king. Like he's the one to take the credit. He's the one that's going to boast in the victory because he named his own son, my father is the king. He did the very thing that he said wouldn't and shouldn't happen. Verse 33, as soon as Gideon died, 
the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals. You say, duh, of course they did. Gideon led them down that road and that path. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. Do you see how important it is that we tell stories of what God is doing so that we know, so that we don't forget Verse 35, and they did not show steadfast love to the family of uh, Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done for Israel. So even though Gideon, in a sense, is a tragic figure that led them back into idolatry, the author still tells us that God used him and God worked through him and God did some wonderful things through him. He's even mentioned by the writers of Hebrews. So there's this aspect of him in his weakness, God being patient with him and God used him, but then he turned and he turned the heart of the nation back against. And this shows us at the end where the people's hearts really and truly were. I think it's a tragic story. There's some good that Gideon did, but I'm not sure he's one that you wanna set my life after. And so whether it was thousands of years ago or whether it's right now or whether it's thousands of years in the future if the Lord doesn't return, the answer and the response is the same. To whom or to what are we going to fix our eyes upon? There is a battle and there is a war that is going on for your heart. Our hearts were not made to be neutral. Our hearts are made to be inclined to something, to worship something, to be controlled by something. And if it's not God, it's going to be someone or something else. And I don't have to give you examples because you know it from your own life. Gideon got so caught up in the externals. He got so caught up in experiences. But my prayer for, for me and my prayer for you and my prayer for Calvary Church is that we would be careful to love God, that we would be careful to be committed to him, that we would be careful to do what we need to do to live out and flesh out our loving relationship with him so that our hearts are not inclined towards something else other than him. I don't want my relationship with him to go from the outside in. I want it to come from the inside out. It's not about appearances. It's not about putting on a good show. But where is my heart? Where is your heart this morning? We want to be our, in a place where our hearts are fixed on him. And from the inside out, we are loving him and clinging to him. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for how you used Gideon. Thank you for how patient you were with him. Father, thank you for how we can learn from him. That although you taught him and used him and he trusted, his heart was still not totally sold out. And we saw him say the right things externally, but not have his heart inclined to you. Would you do a work so that each and every one of our hearts, so that the heart of Calvary Church could be focused on you and focused on what's most important? And that's the loving relationship that we have with you. May we be a people that love you from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing together in response.
to live from the inside out, clinging to him, loving, to, loving him, fixing our eyes upon him. As we leave here today, maybe it's time for you to take a next step. If you're here for the first time or it's only been a few times, love for you to join us in the welcome gathering, east end of the lobby, big sign out front, no more than 10 minutes of your time. If you're saying, I've been here a long time and I just need to get connected, uh, courtyard overlook straight through the back, connect at Calvary. Next week, discover Calvary 915 in the chapel. Here in the auditorium, we will be on week three of Fix My Eyes and we're gonna look at Samson. We will see you then. Have a great week.